Our sermon today is taken from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 21. This is the word of the Lord. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to be to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Thus says the Lord. Friends, today we are continuing in our series, the book of Romans, and we're in the middle of Romans chapter 10. And the best way that I can think of how to explain this passage is by first being very specific with who it is that Paul is actually addressing here. If we don't do that, I think that we'll end up just kind of going all over the place. So before we begin to study our passage today, let's first clarify who it is that Paul is specifically talking to here. And if you heard our sermon last week, the beginning of Romans chapter 10, you might remember that Paul here is specifically talking to the religious Jews who back then grew up as a part of God's people and knew the Old Testament really well and have heard of all these promises about the coming Messiah, and have heard sermons about God's Savior who'll one day come to save us from our sins over and over again, but yet, when Christ actually came, they rejected him. They didn't believe in him. That's who Paul is talking to here. In other words, Paul here is talking to people who perhaps grew up in church, around God's people, went to Sunday school, belonged to a Christian community who perhaps know their Bible really well and have heard the gospel over and over and over again, but yet they have not received Christ as their Savior. They have not trusted him for the forgiveness of their sins. This is the specific group of people that Paul is addressing in this passage, lifelong churchgoers who grew up in the covenant community, who was surrounded by God's people, who's been exposed to God's word and the good news of Christ, but yet they themselves haven't actually received Christ as Savior. They're not born-again Christians. Now, if the description above doesn't describe you, right, you don't feel like you're a part of that category, don't, don't check out. There's still tons of things here that you can learn from this passage about who God is by the way he interacts with those who do fall under the category above. And at the end of the passage, Paul does also address people who don't necessarily belong to that category, as we'll see at the end, okay? So, so don't check out and still tune in. All right, so with that main audience in, in mind and with that context in mind, there's three things that I wanna point out from our passage today. First, the signs of a churchgoer who hasn't received Christ as Savior. Second, the reason why you haven't received Christ as Savior. And third, how your heart can be lured back to Christ, your Savior. Signs of a church goer who hasn't received Christ as Savior, the reason why you haven't received Christ as Savior, 
and how your heart can be lured back to Christ, your Savior. Let's go to the first point. Signs of a church girl who hasn't received Christ as Savior. Now, what Paul does here in the first part of our passage in verses 5 to 12, he begins by listing tons of Old Testament passages. That's all he does. And he shows these religious Jews who don't believe in the gospel that the scriptures they've been reading their whole lives, the Old Testament, is actually filled with the gospel. It all points to the gospel. They've heard it, Paul's trying to tell them. They've seen it. They've memorized it. They've, they've, they've read it their whole lives. But for some reason, it just hasn't clicked. They haven't been able to put two and two together. You've been drenched in Bible your whole life, Paul is saying to them, but your life itself hasn't actually been changed by the power of the gospel. So, so here's all I want to do in this first point. I want to take a look at all of these passages in the Old Testament that Paul refers to here, and I want to see how they all point to Christ. And then I want to explore how understanding these passages in light of the gospel would actually change how one would feel about the Bible and about God. Okay, if that doesn't seem clear to you as of now, don't worry. Um, let's go through them first, and hopefully it'll get clearer as, as we go. Okay, the first Old Testament reference that Paul refers to here, you can find in verse 5. Paul says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. And then Paul quotes what Moses says in verse, uh, in, in, in verse 5, what Moses said in Leviticus chapter 18. Okay, this is what Moses says, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. Here's what Paul's saying. Look, I know you've, you've heard this passage before to these Jewish non-Christians, right, who've grown up in church. You've heard this passage before. You've heard other passages like this your whole life. Passages that say, live by the Ten Commandments, obey God's commandments. You've heard that your whole life, and you thought that it was a challenge, right? You thought that it's saying, if you're able to perfectly live by God's commandments, you'll attain righteousness. So every time you hear passages like this growing up, you might have felt this surge of energy rushing through your body as if you've been presented with a mountain to climb. And you pump yourself up to do it and to obey it, which is good. You should feel a surge of energy to obey God when God gives you a command. That's good. But that's not the only emotion you should feel when you hear God give you a command. What else should you feel? And here Paul quickly quotes Moses again in verse 6, but this time he's quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 9. Let's see what he says in verse 6. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart. That, that small phrase, do not say in your heart, that's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 9, and, and stick with me, this is important that you know the context. Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 9, he was in the middle of humbling the Israelites right? He was in the middle of, of, of humbling them because they thought that they made it into the promised land because of their own ability to obey God's commands. Here's the actual quote Moses said. Moses told them, do not say in your heart, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me into possess this land. You see what Paul's trying to do here by connecting what Moses said in Leviticus chapter 18, obey the commandments to what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter nine, you can't enter the promised land by obeying the commandments. He's saying that when you hear the 10 commandments, when you hear God's commands from the Bible, you are meant to feel energetic and try and obey them, but you're also meant to feel incompetent and weak because no one can enter the promised land based on their own righteousness. That's what Moses said. Let's, let's read the Old Testament holistically Paul is saying here to them. See, he's saying, I suspect that every time you read or heard a sermon about God's commandments, you rarely feel weak and incompetent for the most part. I think for the most part, you view it as a personal challenge. All you see is a ladder that you gotta climb to elevate yourself up these different levels of Christianity and then eventually arrive to the promised land. Something that Moses clearly said in Deuteronomy chapter 9, you'll never be able to do. And that's why you're always spiritually exhausted. Which is the first time, the first sign, I think, of a lifelong church-going non-Christian 
is that usually they're always spiritually exhausted. They're always haunted by the possibility that they haven't done enough, that they haven't made themselves presentable enough to God, that they haven't climbed high enough to reach the promised land. One possible sign of a lifelong non-Christian churchgoer is that they're almost always spiritually exhausted. A second sign is that they also usually feel that God is constantly far away. Where do we see that in the passage? Let's continue verse six to eight. Paul here quotes another thing Moses said, this time from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Moses said, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven or who will descend into the abyss, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. And again, we've got to understand the context. When Moses said this in Deuteronomy chapter 30, back then the Israelites were in the middle of making excuses for their disobedience, right? They're, they're disobeying God's laws and they're saying, well, you know, that's because God's laws are so vague. It's just unknowable to us. Like, where can you even find it? Is it high in the heavens or is it down in the abyss? You know, it's just unclear. And Moses in Deuteronomy 30 was in the middle of telling them, no, it's not. What are you talking about? It's literally near us. It's written down right here in these 10 commandments. And it's not high up in the heaven or down in the abyss. It's right in front of you. It's these 10 commandments. This is what you're called to embrace to be saved. But then, if you read verses 6 to 8 uh, in our passage today, you'll see that as Paul quotes Deuteronomy 30, he constantly connects it back to Christ. Okay, let's, let me read it to you. Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Paul's connecting here. He's telling us, look, God's law, God's word that he gave us isn't ultimately the the Ten Commandments. It is, but it's ultimately revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's law, God's, God's word. What did the book of John describe Jesus as? The word of God made flesh and dwelt among us, right? Paul here is saying, stop making excuses as if you don't know where salvation can be found. Stop making excuses as if the secret of salvation is, you know, hidden in the universe somewhere, uh, up in the skies or down in the abyss. No, it's right in front of you. It's in the offer of the gospel, it's in Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ, so to speak, is the Ten Commandments embodied in human flesh. Jesus Christ is God's word, God's righteousness, God's perfect law, clothed in humanity, and he's come near us. He's dwelt among us. He's not far away, as you claim him to be. See, a lifelong non-Christian churchgoer, one, will almost always be spiritually exhausted, and two, will almost always find God to be far away and not near them. But he is near, Paul is saying here. And because of that, Paul continues in verse 9, All you got to do to get into the promised land to be with God is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. (laughs) That's it. That's it. Because he's near. He's come down. He's offering you perfect righteousness right now by believing in Christ. And just to make sure that the Jews knew that Paul isn't just pulling this theology out of thin air, He quotes another Old Testament passage in verse 11. For the scripture says, the Old Testament says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. You've known this your whole life. You've heard this over and over again. In order to not be put to shame, for your sins to be forgiven, all you gotta do is believe in him. But you know, I've spoken to a lot of church-going non-Christians who haven't received Christ as Savior, and usually, when they realize it's this easy, so to speak, instead of relief, they feel suspicion. That's too easy, they'd often say. That's all you gotta do? Just believe in your heart and confess your mouth? That's too easy. That sounds like a cop-out, if you're asking me. You're telling me that I, who's been religious my whole life, has the same chance of getting into heaven with someone who's been sinning their whole life? 
Paul here responds, yes. He continues in verse 12. For there's no distinction between a religious Jew or a non-religious Greek. But the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Through Christ, all have sufficient access to the Father, no matter your past. But for many, that just sounds too easy. How can a God so holy be so accessible? So, so let's summarize. Usually, lifelong churchgoers who have not received Christ as Savior, one, feel spiritually exhausted a lot. Two, feel God to be always distant. And three, is suspicious about just how accessible salvation is through Christ. Those, I think, are, are three signs of a lifelong church goer who's not actually born again Christian. Now, before we move on to our second point, let me just clarify. I'm not saying that if you've ever felt these things, it means, therefore, that you're a lifelong non-Christian churchgoer. No, that's not, what I'm, that's not what I'm saying, okay? Sometimes true born-again Christians can have bouts of suspicion, too. They can ask themselves, is it really this easy to get into heaven? Is God really that accessible? Of course you would have moments like that. John Piper would go as far as saying that if you've never had that thought cross through your mind, that means you've actually not fully grasped just how profound the gospel is. You felt that, I felt that. I'm not saying that if you've ever felt these emotions, you're not a Christian. All I'm saying is that if the majority of your life, you'd say that you've never experienced true spiritual rest. If the majority of your life, you feel like you've rarely experienced God to be present near you at all. And that more often than not, you feel the gospel as a cop-out for lazy people rather than a blessing for sinners. If the majority of your life you felt these things, I think it's fair to ask yourself whether or not you truly have received Christ as Savior. And if you're listening to this today and you're thinking to yourself, man, that actually kind of describes me. And you're asking yourself, why is that? You know, how can it be that I've been exposed to so much Bible and I've heard so many sermons and I've been a part of so many Bible studies and I've done so much church but yet, till today, I still constantly and strongly feel all those things mentioned above. I'm never at rest. I really feel, rarely feel him to be near me, if ever. And I rarely rejoice in what Christ has done for me on the cross. How can I have been exposed to so much Bible but still be here in my spiritual walk? Well, let's go to our second point. The reason why you haven't received Christ as Savior. Now, in this point, I'm not going to be so presumptuous to assume that I know the reason. <laughs> But let's just see what Paul claims the reason is here in verses 14 to 19, okay? Let's first talk about verses 14 to 15. Here Paul says, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And who are they? how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Now at face value, these verses sound like Paul is, given, is commanding us to share the gospel to others. And that's definitely part of this verse, but that's not Paul's main point here. Remember, he's still speaking to these Jewish non-Christians. And what Paul is actually saying is this. Yes, it is true that you can't believe if you haven't heard, and that you can't hear if no one preaches to you, and that no one will preach to you unless God sends them. That's true. But look, you have heard. It has been preached to you. God has sent preachers your way multiple times. But even now, after all this, you don't believe. Let me show you where I got down the passage. Let's read the whole thing again, up to verses 18 to 19 this time. How then would they call on him who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? Then, verse 18, but I ask, Paul says, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. And then verse 19, did Israel not understand? That's a rhetorical question. They do. And then verse 21, but yet all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. See, reading this passage as a whole informs us that in Romans chapter 10, verse 14 to 15, Paul isn't primarily commanding us to preach the gospel to those who haven't heard. Paul is primarily rebuking those who have heard the gospel their whole lives, but yet refuse to believe because they have heard and they have understood. Paul's saying, you've heard. 
plenty of times. You've been exposed to this plenty of times. God has orchestrated every external circumstance to your favor to receive Christ as Savior. Your parents, your friends, your Sunday school, your church, even perhaps your weekday school, but yet you still don't believe. People have been sent. You've heard, but you don't believe. Why? What factor is left? If every external thing has been set to your favor and you still don't believe, what factor is left? Your heart. The only thing holding you back from embracing the truth of the gospel is your own hardened heart. And look, if you find yourself relating to this lifelong churchgoer who hasn't received Christ as Savior, allow me right now to address you directly. You've heard the gospel plenty of times from plenty of people. And today, I'm just another random guy God sent your way. And if you want your heart lured to the gospel, aside from, of course, praying to God and begging God to, to change your heart, here's another thing you have to see. You have to realize that all these people that's been sent your way, me today, and all the other people that will be sent your way in the future, these are not random separate instances uh, of, of random people just coming your way. This is God reaching out to you. This whole time, it wasn't us who's been extending our arms to you. It's God. He's been extending his arms to you your whole life. And if you want your heart to have a chance to be lured back to him, you have to see this, which takes us to our last point, how your heart can be lured back to Christ, your savior. And what we see at the end of our passage is that God is telling us that it's him that's been pursuing your whole life. And you have to see, you have to see that. You have to see just how jealous God is for you. Where do we see that in the passage? Well, let's take a look at verse 19. God says to you, I'll make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With, with a foolish nation, I'll make you angry. And then verse 20, God says, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I've shown myself to those who did not ask me. Okay, what does all this mean? Well, let's, let's break it down. Let's first talk about who is this foolish person in verse 19 who God himself said, humanly speaking, was never meant to be part of his people, okay? Who is this person in verse 20 who is described to have never sought God, but yet God included into his family? Well, it's people who never grew up in church. It's people who was not born in a Christian family and who was never originally connected to a covenant community growing up, but yet later in life they received Christ and Savior. In other words, it's people like me. <laughs> I never grew up in church, but yet God pursued me later in life. Now, what does this have to do with anything? You know, am I just gloating about coming to Christ even though I didn't grow up in church? No. The point here is, unlike you, I never went to Sunday school. I never learned the Bible growing up like you did. And, and this is kind of embarrassing to admit but I remember when I was in, in seminary, I also worked part-time in this church as a children's ministry director uh, in this church. And, you know, the kids that I was leading, they're about 10 to 13 years old. And one time I remember that I went with them to this summer camp type thing, right? And one night they had this uh, Bible trivia night and the camp leader set it up as like this competition where the camp director would ask these Bible questions, you know, and, and me being a seminary person, you know, said, I got this, you know, uh, let's go ahead and win this. <laughs> and then the first question came out and I was so confident in myself and the camp director asked, who was the smallest tribe of Israel in the book of Numbers? And I was like, who in the world would know that? <laughs> who would know that question? And then one of the kids, without even thinking, without even spending time, raised his hand and said, Manasseh. <laughs> and I was like, Mana who? <laughs> who would know that? How, how do you know that? And then the camp leader asked a second question, you know, what kind of bird brought Elijah food while he was in hiding? And again, I was like, 
seriously, who would know the questions, the answers to these questions? And immediately another kid from another church raised her hand and said, ravens. And I was in disbelief. I thought to myself, how in the world do they just know all this Bible stuff on the top of their heads? Because they grew up in church. They grew up in Sunday school. And you may not know the answers to those specific trivia questions, but I'm fairly certain that if you grew up in church and we had a Bible trivia quiz right now, you'd be surprised about how much Bible it is that is actually logged in the back of your minds, just sitting there simply because you're exposed to it your whole life. Also, Bible songs. I noticed that. <laughs> I remember I was driving these kids to camp and, and on the road, they were singing all these Bible songs and I had no idea what they were, right? Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. And I was in the front driving going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> pretending like I knew the song. I didn't know any of these songs. Or the Indonesian version was, you know, happy ya ya ya, happy ye ye ye, saya senang jadi anak Tuhan, right? If you grew up in church, you would just kind of know these songs without thinking twice. It's like second nature to you. And you may even know all the dances. What's my point? Look, humanly speaking, in a sense, I was never meant to be a part of any of this. What you guys have, this gospel family, the embrace of God as as father, Humanly speaking, I was never meant to be included. I didn't grow up in all this. That's what God meant here. I'll make you jealous of those who are not a nation. I was supposed to be part of God's kingdom, but yet I'm in. People like me, we are these foolish people who had no idea who the true triune God of the universe is, who had no idea how significant the Bible is, who had no idea what the gospel is. But if God wanted people like me who was never a part of his covenant family growing up, how much more do you think he wants you? Someone who he has in his sovereign control decided to place in the loving care of his gospel community ever since you were born. Look at verse 21, all day long, God's held out his hand to you. From the day he decided that you'd be born under Christian parents, of course they're not perfect. But still, from the day he connected you to your first group of friends at church, from the day you first met that Sunday school teacher that perhaps was a little bit awkward, but nonetheless was unbelievably passionate about the gospel, from the day you were first introduced to happy ya ya ya, from the day you graduated from Sunday school and started to hear sermons in adult church, ever since, The sovereign God of the universe has been extending his arms to you, saying, will you receive what I'm offering you on the cross? Will you stop trying to earn your own way into my kingdom and realize that the gospel is not too good to be true? Because in a very real sense, God has given you benefits he never gave people like me. He's giving my children benefits that he's never given me. And I'm not playing who's less privileged game here. I'm just trying to show you how jealous God is for you and just how long he's been extending his arms to you. Will you receive? Now let me end the sermon by addressing both non-Christians who like me never grew up in church and non-Christians who has grown up in church. If you're like me and you didn't grow up in church and you have zero idea what happy ya 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 is and you've never heard the gospel before, you're hearing it now. That means the God of the universe is extending his arms to you today. And you and I may have been fools our whole lives who never sought God. And the words Sunday school and church may as well be synonyms to the word corny to us. Believe me. I get it. I really do. But of course it's corny to us because we never understood the love of God that's behind all of it and we were never in love with him. Isn't it funny that love songs can sound really corny when you're not in love, but when you are, all of a sudden, they sound just fine.
And if you have grown up in church most of your life, but yet haven't received Christ as Savior, I hope you see that God has actually been extending his arms to you your whole life. And he's very jealous for you. You've been living in his kingdom your whole life. You just never became citizens. Will you finally receive the gospel and be done with this exhaustion? Realizing that the God you've been running after this whole time already ran your way when he came down and died on the cross in your place. Will you? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you call on him and finally be his? I hope you will. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and we magnify your name that you would have mercy upon those who are far off, upon those who never grew up in your covenant community, who never grew up in church, who had no idea what the Bible was, what the gospel is, who you are. You sought us out and you revealed in your sovereignty, you revealed the sweetness of the gospel, not just to our ears and to our heads, but to our hearts. And it changed us and we've been transformed by it. And to you and to you alone, we say thanks. But also we praise you for your patience and for your love to those who you have decided to be born in a Christian family, in the church, and grown up hearing the gospel their whole lives. I pray that you would make this gospel sweet to them as well, not just to their ears, they've heard it. It's been preached to them. You have sent people to them. They've heard it. Will you make them believe? Will you give them the same mercy you give other sinners so that they will finally taste the very thing they've been hearing and looking at their whole lives? Will they finally not just preview you from a distance, but experience what it means to be held in your arms? Have them rest by telling them that you are near and that all they need to do is receive the gift of righteousness you've offered them on the cross. You are that accessible. Thank you, Father, for this mercy, for this kindness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.